Hi, it's me. Just want to remind you as we're going through these videos that there are a lot of things we're going to cover in this class that are controversial. There are a lot of things that scholars disagree with and disagree about. And there are a lot of things that I'm going to talk about in these videos and that I'm going to present in class that I don't necessarily even agree with, but they are questions that you might want to consider, things that might help you to think about the text in a new way. And the videos are going to highlight specific points in particular texts that give you some things to think about, some questions to consider, some ways of thinking about or asking questions about the text that otherwise you might not have considered. That's all they are. So please know that there is no way that I would expect you to agree with me. I'm not presenting these as the only way or the one correct way to look at the text. I am presenting them in an effort to be helpful and to give you things to think about and consider. If they're helpful to you, then that's great. Please consider the texts, think about them, consider the questions that I'm asking and the points that I'm raising. If they're not useful, then, then don't worry about it. That's, uh, there are plenty of other things that you've got to read and plenty of other things that you've got to do. So concentrate on them. And I hope that uh, some of this somewhere is useful to you as we look at some really interesting texts and consider some really interesting questions. Thanks. Hi. In this video, we're going to take a look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And in addition to looking at some interesting points in those two chapters, one of the things that I hope we'll be able to do is to give you a little bit better insight into the kinds of things that biblical scholars are pointing to when they identify certain features in the text, vocabulary, phrases, certain theological affirmations, and other things that they see as evidence that a particular text might have come from a different source or from a different time or from a different theological school of thought from another text. Sometimes even when the texts, as in this case, are right next to each other. The other thing that I hope we'll be able to do, in addition to looking at some interesting features of the text, is to model and to help you to begin to develop a habit that a lot of people would refer to as a, a close reading of the text. Oftentimes, it's very easy for us to fill in gaps when we're reading the biblical text. We know that there are things in other parts of the Bible, and so sometimes we kind of import those into the text we're reading. And one of the things I want to help you to try to develop is to get into the habit of looking very closely and very specifically at the words, the phrases, the theological affirmations that you find in a particular text and to focus on those to help you interpret that text. Uh, I, I do affirm, as I think the Protestant tradition has all along, the principle that texts interpret texts. And so I'm, I'm not saying that that's not a way that we should read things. It's just that in order for one text to interpret another, you've got to understand what each text is affirming in its own right before you try to have one text interpret another. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these texts and some of the things that they are telling us. Let's start with the first part, and that's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and it goes up through chapter 2, verse 3. One of the things you'll notice as you read through this text is that it is very orderly. There is a clear progression from simple things to more complex things. There's a great deal of symmetry as each day moves. You see day two, there is the creation of the sky and the seas as separate entities. And then on day five, there is the creation of animals to inhabit each one of those spheres. So they're, they're birds for the sky and they're fish and even a sea monster for the sea. On day three, the seas are separated from the dry land and plants begin to grow. And then on day six, you get the animals that live on dry land and that, and that eat the plants. Days one, four, and seven divide time into the basic components by which we, we measure and mark time. The, the calendar, the seasons, the, the week, which is the, the basic way in which ancient Israel 
uh, divided time. Everything is moving towards a climax. Everything seems to be, each step seems to be done with the next step in mind. And it's all pointing towards a climax, the, the, the pinnacle of creation, the, the creation of human beings. And notice that in this chapter it's beings, male and female, God created them, plural. And these human beings are created at the, at the apex of creation. They are the, the, the one creation that is said to be in the image of God. It's, it's the one creation that's giving, given power over the other things that God has created. So there's, there's this very orderly, majestic way in which God creates. Everything that God creates, God creates by speaking. God says the word and the thing comes into being. And the, the word here that's used for God is, is the very common word in the Old Testament, Elohim. It's a, 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 actually a, a plural word, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later on. But it doesn't mean that God is plural. It's just a, a way of dis distinguishing the God of Israel from the other gods, uh, which uh, might be described using a similar word. When you get to chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, and going to the end of the chapter, notice that things are a little bit different. First of all, the name. In chapter 2, it's the Lord God, or in Hebrew, it would be Yahweh Elohim. Notice also that, that the order is a little different. Uh, instead of everything being leading up to the creation of uh, human beings, plural, male and female, God really starts with creating a person, one. And it pointedly says there, there were no plants yet. But in the other one, the plants were created on day three and humans on day six. And there's just one. And instead of God speaking this human being into existence, God is, is depicted as almost forming and, and, and creating uh, almost as if by hand uh, this human being and then, and then breathing into the human being the breath of life. A couple of things to note here also. Uh, this is not a person named Adam. Uh, I hate to tell you that, but it's true. In fact, in Hebrew, this, this word Adam, or we would say Adam, is used with the definite article. And just as in English, we don't use a definite article with a person's name. Uh, we don't say the Joe or the Mary. It's just Joe or Mary. Hebrew is exactly the same way. They don't ever use a definite article when you're talking about a person's name. And yet here throughout this story, it is Ha-Adam, the person. In fact, the, the rabbis who were writing about this text around the time of Jesus always refer to him not as Adam, as if that's a, per, a personal name, but as Ha-Adam HaRishon, the first person. One other thing to notice about this word Adam, it, it really does mean something a little bit closer to person uh, as we would use it in English, rather than man. There is a, a word pair in Hebrew that means man and woman, but it's ish and isha, and that's not the word that's used here of this person. It's, it's, it's Adam. There actually is a feminine counterpart to that word Adam, and it is used here in this text, but it doesn't mean woman. It actually means ground or earth, and the text says that he was called Adam because he was taken from the Adama, from the dirt. So the word pair is used there, but it's, it's not male and female. It's, it's not man and woman. It's just person, and then the other word has nothing to do with uh, the meaning of, of person or human being. One other thing to, to note about this is it, it's common for us to think that the the woman is taken from the rib of the man, and that is a possible translation of that word in Hebrew. It's possible to read that as rib. However, the, the word can also mean in Hebrew side. And so one other way to think about this, and I can give you some references for this if you're interested in exploring this some more, but one of the ways of, of thinking about this is that what God creates at the beginning 
is a sort of genderless human being and that the the finishing of the creation of human beings is actually the the separation of a male person from a field female person and the creation of gender uh, obviously it's not always the way this text has been read but it is at least one possible interpretation of what's going on in this text but notice the the contrast with chapter one whereas in chapter one everything's very orderly and everything seems to be leading up to a climax to the creation of human beings here human beings are created first and it's almost as if god is i hate to say it, it's almost as if god is kind of experimenting god creates the animals to see if there is a companion for the man and it, it doesn't work out and so then god goes to to, to plan b a very different kind of image of creation, a very different kind of way of talking about God and God's relationship to creation than what we saw in chapter one. So those are some of the kinds of things that people, that scholars are pointing to when they, when they note that there are features of the text, the, the change in the name for God, the, the change in the details about the order of creation, the, the way in which there, there, are, there are subtle differences of vocabulary here and there in the two texts that has often led scholars to suppose that maybe these two stories come from different times or from different theological traditions and that now they've been woven together. Clearly, it's, it's still very easy to read these two as one continuous narrative, as, as most of us usually do. It's very easy to read this as chapter one giving you kind of the overview of creation and then chapter two focusing in intensely on the creation of human beings and how all that happened. And it's, it's certainly possible to read it that way. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't read it that way, but I'm also trying to point out to you that there are features in the text that, that could very easily lead one to read this in a rather different way. I hope this has helped. And I hope you found something interesting and useful as you read through chapters one and two.